It's now my pleasure to introduce Joelle Faulkner from Area One Farms. Joelle will be presenting on an equity model for farm expansion in Canada. This will be about a 20 minute presentation with 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers following that. So welcome Joelle, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so Thanks for I'm here from Area One Farms. Uh, I'll give you a bit of our background because most people won't know who we are. Um, most probably haven't heard of us before and explain a bit on what we do, uh, how we work with farmers across the country and what we kind of hope to achieve. And that'll, and then we'll have a lot of time for questions. Um, so uh, those can all follow. Area one, I started with my brother in 2011. Um, and we really got it going in 2013. So in terms of our partnerships, we partner with farmers to help them expand. We buy land and machinery with them to create a joint venture. And in that joint venture, mostly do crop production, but some cattle. And we, we own with the partner. So it's another alternative to debt or to uh, rental that lets you have take advantage of land opportunities when they come up to buy them, make sure that you have the right equipment and infrastructure to manage over the time, because those can be big cash flow drains and make sure more of your money is invested in the land because you have a partner across uh, the other parts of the business. The idea isn't a replacement for the other options. So I always tell people there's no partner better than having no partner. So if you can comfortably expand the way you want with debt, debt is really inexpensive and has a has a really great place for most people. Um, but when you get beyond that, when you're trying to think of including the next generation and maybe you have three kids who are interested in farming and you have a farm big enough to add one of them to, but maybe not all three, or you have a landlord that's significant and they're ready to sell and you wanna keep that land as opposed to letting it go because it's hard to replace. Or you have a couple purchases that come up at the same time and maybe if it was a couple years from now and they were spaced out, you could swing all of them. But the opportunity is now because as we know, most land trades once every 25 years. So it, it just isn't gonna come up again in another couple. Those are places where we can be helpful. And the way we do things is we put in money the farm partner puts in money. We agreed a joint venture to own for 10 years at least together. And we're, we own that together and we operate it together. So the joint venture then takes out the operating line to put the crop in to cover all the operating expenses. Whatever part you own, you own. Meaning the uh, amount of equity you have in, you own that part in full. You get all the income and all the appreciation on it. On the rest of the land, the part that we put in money for, you get you get some of the income and some of the appreciation. So even though you didn't put in the money to buy it, you get some of the income, some of the appreciation. Another way of thinking about it is you don't have the risk of a rental payment or an interest payment, but you're still earning part of what that land goes up if it goes up. And that's probably the key that we think like we think this partnership is generally to help people be able to afford more land later so they can afford everything that they can do now now um, but as many of you know we've been in an environment where land has continued to appreciate and if that's the case you kind of always get further and further away from from buying that land and if we can buy it with you now one you have it secured two you don't have risk on it going forward because those inputs and machinery are covered. And three, you have the ability to buy it back and you've earned some of what it went up. It's an unusual model. The idea of a landlord or um, another party giving you part of what land goes up is really unusual. And so uh, if you hear this, but you're like, huh, I wonder how that really works. That is a pretty common question. I'm happy to look at different partnerships and have a unique niche in that in addition to regular ready to go farmland, we do a lot of land improvement work. So we partner with a number of farmers in areas where we can clean up land and we 
buy that land with them. We buy the machinery and teach them how to do the cleanup work, how to organize it. We do the cleanup and we essentially build land. And the reason for that is that's actually a super hard activity to finance because that land won't cash flow for the first three years or so. Uh, it's, it's really hard for banks to support farmers, even farmers who have a history of doing that work and doing it. So a lot of the time you're stealing from your operating line to do capital improvements, um, which puts some financial pressure on the farm. But we think that idea of increasing the productivity of land is worth doing, especially in this kind of uh, environment where, where commodities are, are worth a lot, not just in the last three months, even before that. And, and our goal is to work with partners to do that. Because of how that's set up, because we're already set up to be your partner across the farm, we can look at opportunities in addition to that. So on farm processing um, or seed production or any of those things where maybe the farm growth isn't what creates a little bit of capital, like where you need extra capital. Maybe it's that the farm is growing at the same time as you need to do a new seed cleaning plant, or if you do do that, you'll have, like it gives you the capacity that you know you could fill, or you have a little bit of on-farm processing. If you expanded that, it's gonna take a couple years until that plant kind of works right, but you wanna do it now. So we're open to all of that. The history to this and how we ended up at such a unique position is that I'm from a dairy farm in London, Ontario. And we looked at, we. We expanded our dairy quite a bit in 2004 and 2006. And we looked at an opportunity to buy land that was beside us at the time. And just like every other farmer, that opportunity comes up once and you know you should do it. Like good deal or not great deal. It's just a thing you should do because it's how it is the best way to grow a farm. And that's probably especially true when you think about things like where to spread manure and stuff like that. And that that growth, we would have needed a partner. So we sat down to decide like if we had a partner, what would we want them to look like? And then I tested with partners over time. So we had a, with our first partner, they were doing a lot of cleanup work. And I said, okay, you know, what works for you? How does this work? How does that work? We came to the idea that they wanted to be part of appreciation in addition to everything else. Cause that's kind of the outlier that you never really notice happened until later. Um, but can get really significant and can be a big part of whether you can afford to grow at a future date. And so we designed around the thing we would want to have. There are, we take investor money to do this investment. We make them agree to terms that let us put together really good partnerships with farmers that are good for us and really good for the farmer. And we do that by basically saying they won't have access to their money for 10 years. They can ask me how it's going. Um, and we're, we're really good at reporting. We're really good at telling people kind of here's what we're doing and how we're doing it. But we aren't guaranteeing returns. So if we have a bad weather year, we had a bad weather year. We had a bad year as investors. The farmer had a bad year as the partner. Everybody had a bad year. And we can actually then take on that risk. And that's a lot different than the approaches that we had seen before from investors. So there aren't a lot of them, but um, what we've seen is investment groups where they're buying land on a lease back model. So they're buying it from a farmer, renting to that farmer. And generally in both cases, this is high. Like it looks like they pay a lot for what it is and they have to rent it back for so much money because they've made such big guarantees to their investors. Um, around what they're getting and that that would be out of step with what we think is probably normal for the area and outside of what we think is good and healthy for the community. So our each joint venture, we put a new farm name together so it matches to whatever the area is. You run things, we look at your history to determine if it's a good fit with us and it, what land values are in your area, because there are a lot of areas that, that we actually just can't make work either. Um, but it gives you this third alternative. So when you think of how you're going to grow, particularly for the next generation, 
Um, the, the alternatives can now be, you can get bank financing, you can, uh, you can not buy it and keep renting or find something else to rent, or you can look at a partnership. And we are that partnership and our hope is to create essentially a gold standard of partnering with farmers where the farmers do so well that, that the other things aren't things that they'll accept anymore. Like the other kinds of partnership or kind of high rents for mediocre land. The, um, I'll share with you a success story uh, or two, just to give you an idea of what these partnerships have looked like. So one partner was, has three kids who are interested in farming. Those kids are all at the age where they're pretty sure they're coming back. So they've either come back or they're at the end of university and, and making the decision to come home. And they have to turn their place, which is mixed crop and cattle into a bigger place. And they had a bit of growth that didn't go perfectly. Um, so they had a bit of a financial trouble to work out, which they had mostly done when they met us. So they had sold some land, downsized the machinery and, and were just figuring out how do they make the family farm survive. And because of our partnership, they were able to stop thinking through just how you make it survive and think through what they wanted to grow to and, and start on that path. And we'll grow their operation big enough that it can support them and three kids, it looks like, or three separate families. That that operation will continue to be crop and cattle, in their case, more cattle. And that we've we've worked with them to find the right areas to do land improvement work on and taught them how to do that. And we have one of our partners who's not that far away, work with them to help them with things that, that they thought might be helpful. So machinery choices as they expand, understanding better methods for clearing land and cleaning it up, um, and really try to support them at every stage. We're helpful where possible. So, you know, we're as helpful as we can be. We try to find good answers for our partners when they ask questions, um, but there's a limit to that. Just like most other things I read, we didn't know commodity prices would do this. And so we were mostly sold a month and a half ago on most of our farms. And that wasn't our decision. That was each farmer's decision, but, you know, if we if we could have provided more assistance to help understand where the markets were going, we would have, but it was, just wasn't a thing to know. Um, whereas when we think through land buying, we actually do have a fair bit of experience there between all our partners. And so we can think through what strategy is gonna work best, maybe within an area, what kind of land makes sense to focus on. We can work through with our partners around their budgets and what they're planning to see um, you know, is there a better way to do what they're doing? And that's where we start getting into mentorship from other partners or, or coaching. The, uh, the second example is one where we're doing a lot of cleanup work. And so that one's in an area where the area has a lot of cleanup work opportunity. The partner had only bought ready farmland because cleaning up was something they weren't sure, certain of before. Um, but over time, that place will become about half and half. It was one where the partner was renting most of their land. So they had some equity and land, but they didn't have a ton in their land because they were renting a lot of their farm base and two of their big landlords wanted to sell. And so we bought out the landlords, went into partnership and we expanded from there. The most of our partnerships is about the next generation. There are some there are, there's one, I guess, that isn't, that was really about opportunity, but in a lot of cases, it's two generations that we're working with and thinking about. Um, in a lot of cases, it's that there's some opportunity to buy land that came up. It's just a bit too big for, for what uh, the partners got the equity for. And then our being an equity partner really helps them. So that should give you an idea of us. Um, and I'm happy to take questions as you have them or clarify anything or go into specifics, whatever you need. And mostly thanks for having me. It is uh, 
in, we've been doing this eight years, like this is our ninth crop year. We have 24 partners across the country, which is why I say it's unlikely that you've heard of us because we don't usually get such a good audience. Now we'll just wait for questions to come in through the chat. Perfect. I will have a sip of tea. I can't submit a question by chat. I don't know how, <laughs> but I'd like to ask a question if you don't mind. Uh, you say yeah, you've got 24. Like. Great. Joelle, you've got 24 partnerships. Is that what you said? Yeah. And um, what provinces are those partnerships in? Uh, so far in Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta. We have um, we have some in Saskatchewan, but uh, we have non-Canadian investors. So in Saskatchewan, uh, or Manitoba, anything that we do does have to go through the Farmland Ownership Board in Saskatchewan and um, the Farm Business or Farm Industry Business, Farm Business Industry Board, maybe is what it's called in Manitoba, um, and and get specific approval. And right. we're, we're super careful about that. We're really clear about it because we want to ensure not just that we're doing well by the farmer, but also by the community in the province. And are there specific uh, things that a person's farm would kind of automatically be disqualified from your model? Like I, I, I think maybe in PEI, it's not a very good fit for one reason or another. Just wondering if you might want to share some of that for people to decide if they might qualify or not. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the biggest is we don't do any of the quota-based industries. So uh, dairy, chicken, egg um, isn't a place that we operate. We actually don't do anything in the hogs, hog business either. I'm, I don't understand it enough is the big limiting factor. So I kind of slowly have been understanding more areas. And as everybody knows, it's way more complicated than you think. So we started with crop, we've expanded to cow-calf. Um, that's where we are at the moment. The, there's some parts of crop that we're not in that I think we could be, we need the right partners. Um, PEI has specific ownership restrictions that would need also exemptions. Uh, and I've never looked into those. So I don't know if we would end up being able to get them or wouldn't, I suspect it would depend on the partnership uh, and on the view of the province, but but I'm not 100 percent sure. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Andy Kyven Oven asks: you Only invest in land, or also other farm assets such as? Greenhouses? Sorry, such as? Such as greenhouses. Yeah. Uh, we primarily invest in land. So we can do other farm assets like grain elevators and machinery and stuff like that. But with a greenhouse, most of the time, the greenhouse is actually a lot more expensive than the land part of it. And in those cases, we aren't a good fit. Again, it's an industry we haven't, I haven't had the time to fully understand. Okay, we have another question from Humphrey Bannock. He asks, in the case of a loss in the production, is the loss shared? Will this need to be repaid by the operator in the future? It's a really good question. The loss is shared in the same way as we share profits. So you own your part of the, of the loss. Um, we do, because some years there's losses and some years there's profit, we do add it up kind of over time so that so that you basically everybody's going to end up with profit later that'll compensate for it hopefully but uh, if it's just losses and losses and losses we're sharing in those in the same way we own okay and i have a series of questions from bill campbell and i'll, I'll give them to you one at a time so first hey. is 
where do you funds for the home to purchase? Yeah, so I I deal with investors, and so I put together uh, investor money into under agreements that really limit any changes that they can have. So it's not that I match one investor to one farm and suddenly you have a partner named Bill showing up at your place. I have the ability to uh, invest money on up to 10 year terms, which is what we do, so that we make 10 year partnerships with farmers. And then at the end of 10 years, they buy out the portion that they want to, or we both decide we're gonna keep going. And if we do that, we kind of get to that decision again every five years after that. Okay, and his next question uh, is, are there offshore investment for firms or pension fund investors involved? Um, so we actually, I'm a little indifferent to it. So most of our money is Canadian, but not 100%. Uh, well, I'm really careful that, that no investor, whether they're Canadian or not, whether they're a person or, or a group, has any ability to make decisions on anything. Um, but I also, what I need on my side to be able to make these long-term agreements is I can't have a person who, because they got a divorce needs to sell and that's in year three. Like they have to be able to give me their money long-term and getting that right agreement that gives me the ability to, to support the farmers properly is actually more important to me then saying yes to a certain investor and no to somebody else. So we self-select a lot of people out because they would like more liquidity options than we can offer. Bill also asks, uh, what, what did you mean by the cleanup of land purchases? Is that referring to um, the removal of trees and the drainage of slouts? Uh, yeah, it depends on the areas, but but a lot of the time we're taking stuff that was timbered recently back into agricultural production. Only private land um, where it wasn't reseeded for timber purposes and drainage we do a fair bit of, uh, obviously all in line with any of the drainage regulations and working with any of the water stewardship boards. Um, but we do invest where it will increase productivity, not just in in surface drainage, but also in tile drainage. And his final question is, um, is there any concern that your firm may inflate land values, uh, making it more difficult for young farmers? It's a really good question. So we actually are super careful to not do that because I think that is probably the biggest concern about investors generally. And uh, and is a real and legitimate concern. Our goal is to have partnerships with farmers that can eventually buy us out. Um, at the same time, I don't want to buy things at the high top end of the market. Like it, it, it doesn't work well for me either because if, you know, in a normal world where sometimes things go up and sometimes they go down and sometimes they stay steady, I don't want to be in a position where things don't work for us. So generally, we are not successful bidders in on-market purchases. Generally, it's all private purchases between our partners and uh, their people mostly that they're renting from. Okay, and the next question is from Ron Maynard. It asks, uh, what is the main selling point that you are pushing your investor? Uh, that's a good question. We, we think that long-term farmland prices will probably continue to rise. So what we tell our investors is that, that this is probably not super risky and also probably isn't super high return. So I don't necessarily think farmland prices will keep rising as quickly as we've seen them um, rise in the past. But I do think probably over time, it'll go up. The bigger piece for our investors is actually different, which is that this is a very different asset than things they normally own. So normally they have maybe commercial real estate and maybe they have um, 
toll roads or bridges that are pay or things like that. And when something like COVID happens, those things actually, even though they're different things, their slowdown all happens together, right? So people don't go in as much to office buildings. They're probably not using the toll roads that get them there. And so they have, even though they have very different things, they have a bunch of the same risk. Investors uh, have started to think about some places where maybe there's a different kind of risk and farming is a different kind of risk. It certainly has a lot of risk and we take more of it than if you are in a rental kind of structure, but, um, but it's a different risk. And so we were relatively unaffected by COVID as, as most people were, but really affected by poor commodity prices or bad weather the last couple of years. And so that idea that it can be something different is of interest to investors. All of that said, we get investors who really want to invest in a way that farmers like, where we can really build out family farms long term. Because if you don't have that as a goal, you are better off investing with with other groups that are bigger than me and um, buy things like are a little less afraid maybe to push up land prices and buy more stuff more quickly and lock in big rent numbers and and uh, kind of give you more of a positive view. Like mine is generally, this is good downside protection if the world kind of messes up in other places. And we're gonna do this in a great way with the right people in communities where we are adding to those communities. Um, you have to you have to almost like that other piece of it that we're doing this in the right way to want to invest with us because it's more as everybody knows it's more complicated when you're actually a producer you have to deal with commodity price risk and weather risk you have to deal with agreements with people and thinking through decisions and like there's just a lot more work and even on the investor side there's a lot more um you have to be in a partnership mindset or or i'm not the right place for you A, a question from Lee Hudson. Um, do you also work with investors that have urban development interests as well as agriculture interests with a farm to house type of mentality? Yeah, I don't. So uh, we don't work with developer investors and we don't target sort of semi development areas. A lot of the time those areas are not priced like farmland and just you have to be in a totally different business and we're not in that business. Okay, another question from Kathleen Gibson. Ask if you have any farm partners in BC as the farmland prices are quite high there. Uh, we don't, it's not necessarily farmland prices. A little bit where we have partners is kind of because we already have partners. So they, they tell other people and then those people call us. So we don't have anything in BC, which is because we don't hear really from people in BC because we don't have any partnerships in BC. So, um, but it, it may very well be that the land is too expensive for us to partner on. But I just don't know. Okay, and there's a final question now, and it's if we are interested in a joint venture, how do we contact you? Uh, so our website uh, has should have a click button I think it's contact at area1farms.ca. Um, but if I'm wrong, you can you can write to me at Joelle, J-O-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at area1farms.ca. Okay, and that is all the questions from the floor. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Joelle. That was a very Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and, and uh, I had noticed. I was going to say I'd noticed an article in the Globe and Mail featuring um, your your business, and it was um, that was January twentieth. So anybody that has access to that, there's some more information in that. I think as well as contact information, and we can certainly uh, forward anyone contact information if they like. So thanks so much for yeah. taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you. The best article I've ever seen on explaining what we do, um, if people 
are interested is a Kevin Hirsch article from the Western producer. Okay. It was a couple years ago, but probably still comes up with Google around Kevin Hirsch and area one farms. He was able to explain our model better than I am like even in writing. So when people are interested, I actually send him his article, uh, but it has a really good idea. And we're, we're, we've been really careful. We've been really slow about how we've been growing and to understand things. So we're now at the point where if we don't fit like to some of those questions you asked, like if we don't fit, we'll be able to tell you pretty quickly. Um, so we don't waste anybody's time, obviously. Uh, and, and thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you have a really wonderful rest of your meeting. I really appreciated being here. Um, and I hope everybody has a great growing season. Super. Thanks very much. We appreciate your time and um, hope it uh, works out for some people in this call who would like to uh, get in business with you.